Good evening, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here with the concluding episode of our China History Podcast General Survey of Xinjiang History, covering the centuries from BCE to the modern age. This one may go into extra innings, and I hope you won't hold me in too much contempt if that happens. Hey, once in a while, I'll put this at the beginning. If you'd like to show some love for the CHP and join my growing family of elite CHP supporters, Go to patreon.com slash China History Podcast. Three frog skins is all I ask. Early access to new episodes, racy stories from my life and career that would get me hustled off this RSS feed in no time at all, and a whole lot more. Patreon not your thing? You can contribute to this worthy cause at paypal.me slash China History Podcast. No fuss, no muss. Thanks for considering that. Details at the show notes at the website at teacup.media. Well, we're going to take this up to 1949, and we may have to fly higher than Felix Baumgartner once again to take it all in, but sometimes the big picture offers you a sufficient enough understanding to digest a lot of what you hear and read. Last time we left off in 1885 with the death of General Zhuo Zongtang, thanks to his efforts and achievements Xinjiang was annexed and turned into a province of China. Authority had been re-established, on paper anyway, same old problem. Without the benefit of advanced technologies, Xinjiang was too big, too diverse, and too spread out to control. And life went on in all the many locales, and their respective histories continued to be made. But there wasn't that much of a nexus between the locals and with the China authorities. All the Qing dynasty rulers wanted was for Xinjiang to be peacefully integrated with China proper and that the place could generate enough taxes and revenue sufficient enough so that this new acquisition for the empire would not be so reliant on the central government. The dynasty didn't survive to see either of those things. And the military out there, well, even if they doubled or tripled the number of forces, it was like... It was like the LAPD trying to enforce law and order in the whole state of California. They could never send enough troops out there to make a difference outside government strongholds. And though throughout this series, I didn't delve too deeply into the details, but in every single location in Xinjiang we've mentioned since part one, these places all had a couple thousand complicated years of history blowing in their sails that made occupation and assimilation, a perpetual, unfulfilled pipe dream. The Turkic people throughout the province weren't going to embrace Chinese ways any more than the Chinese, Manchus, or Mongols were going to embrace theirs. And each successive ruler of the various governments who came and took the place over and tried to rearrange the furniture and give the place a total makeover, they always walked on these hot coals of centuries upon centuries of tradition and deeply rooted thinking. The Han settlers who came to Xinjiang flush with incentives, well, they came and most didn't stay long. And these Han settlers stuck together and mostly all congregated in the northern part of Xinjiang, Tsungaria. Yeah, this whole matter of settling this new province was going to be a real long-term project. Into the 1890s and then the 10-year countdown to the end of the Qing Dynasty. You all remember those years from that Warlord series and from other past episodes. The Boxer Rebellion debacle, Yuan Shikai, Warlordism, Beiyang government, Southern government, crushing indemnities. Any hopes the authorities in Xinjiang had of getting funds for the central government? Eh, Forget about it. Xinjiang was going to have to wait again. The 1887 census of Xinjiang pegged the population at 1,238,583, with 91% being Uyghurs and 5% Han Chinese. In 1907-1908, that figure rose to 1,650,000 to 2 million. Today, the population of Xinjiang is about 25 million with 45% Uyghur and about 40% Han. After Zhuo Zongtang's reconquest, life went on in Xinjiang 
And as the place had always been going back to the beginning, Xinjiang continued in its role as an Asian crossroads, where goods were traded back and forth between China and on to every nook and cranny in the Central Asian markets. These years were China's closest equivalent to our post-Civil War Wild West days, right before, during, and after Jakob Beg. By 1904, the Trans-Siberian Railway was finished, and then in 1929-1930, the Turkestan-Siberian Railway was completed. And following this came all the changes that usually come with the deal. This was a golden age of Russian trading and involvement in Xinjiang. They completely dominated Xinjiang trade, and the Soviet demand for Xinjiang cotton was insatiable. The Treaty of St. Petersburg, the one signed in 1881, put Russian traders in the driver's seat in Xinjiang. In return for handing back the Ely Valley, Russia got to open up a slew of consular offices throughout western China, and they got to enjoy duty-free trade in Mongolia and Xinjiang. They didn't have to pay the taxes that the Chinese traders got stuck paying. And in many cases, the Russians could sell to the locals without any competition. Made in Russia was cheaper than made in China. These were the most exciting of times and very well documented by travelers, officials, and diplomats of that time. Sven Hedin, for example, and his masterpiece, Through Asia, that and many other travelers' tales came out of this age. This was also the time of Sir George McCartney and Francis Young Husband and that 1890 mission to Chinese Turkestan. Kashgar was written about copiously, and no shortage of intrepid travelers from those days of adventure would deny. Kashgar was the place to be. And Xinjiang was spelled S-I-N-K-I-A-N-G in all those old stories. And besides these vacationers to exotic locales, yeah, seeing that spelling also evokes that age when all the greatest adventurers and archaeologists were doing their exploring or plundering of artifacts, depending on your viewpoint, in the Silk Road towns of ancient times. And with the modern world rushing in on them like it was, most of the Turkic inhabitants of Xinjiang were like a dare in the headlights, only wishing to maintain their traditional lifestyle that contained all that they really needed in life. Their mosques, their families, their leisure activities, and the bazaars. This daily rhythm of life well, wasn't so bad. The matter of Xinjiang now belonging to the Qing Empire, well, for most of these sedentary, traditional Muslim Xinjiang inhabitants, well, they never rubbed up against them before. And what happened in Beijing up till now had never had any direct impact on their daily world. Well, I don't mean to jump ahead or anything, but as we all know, 1911, the Qing dynasty fell. And when the end came, Xinjiang wasn't even close to being self-sufficient and was still on the dole to the central government. And when the central government went, well, so went the welfare checks, so to speak. So Xinjiang was in for a very rough and frightful 38 years, and then some. If you recall from the Ten-Part Warlord series, the Xinjin, the New Army that later became the Beiyang Army, well, they sent troops out west to go take over Xinjiang in the name of the provisional government. And this army later got rebranded as the Xinjiang Army, and they had bases in Urumqi and Ili. It would take till January 8, 1912, before the last of the Qing holdouts and royalists could be swatted down and the provisional government in Xinjiang was established in Ili. And then the defeated pro-Qing restorationists ran and tried one last-ditch effort to set up a rival government in Urumqi. And the two contenders went at it immediately, with neither side and their respective allies being able to vanquish the other. Now, one of the players to emerge in Xinjiang during this time was the Ge Lao Hui, the Brothers and Elders Society. They were anti-Qing in their makeup and had thoroughly infiltrated Zhou Zongtang's army. And it was rumored General Zhou himself was a major guy in this secret organization. Like almost all of these 19th century secret societies, the Ge Lao Hui is neck deep in its own lore. After the reconquest of Xinjiang by General Zhou, 
the Gulal Hui ended up running organized crime and got in on the ground floor of the opium business out there. This secret society was mostly made up of Han Chinese, but had a smattering of locals and former soldiers as well. Their power base was mainly in the south, and they cemented their ties with the Ely Provisional Government by carrying out all kinds of dirty work for them. Most well-known, perhaps, was the assassination of many former Qing officials across 11 cities. This Brothers and Elder Society, like these organizations often do, got cozy with the Provisional Government and Ely, and the two enjoyed an unholy symbiotic relationship. The Republic of China government, led by the illustrious Guomindang, they tried their darndest to achieve what the Qing dynasty had failed to do, to establish control out there, tame all the ethnic minorities, and try to establish some semblance of amity and guide China's newest province to a new and productive future. Four men will reign supreme in Xinjiang over the next 35 years, We'll quickly look at each one of them and what the big picture in Xinjiang was during this time. As we all know, for the first four years in the life of the Republic of China, the most powerful man in all the land was Yuan Shikai. He had placed his allies in all the most important regions of China to represent the collective best interests of this Beiyang clique of military strongmen. Then, of course, 1916, Yuan Shikai went down in flames with his failed bid to restore the monarchy. And it's every warlord for themselves for the next dozen years or so. Every province had their own warlord. And Xinjiang was no exception. This was Yang Zengxin. He held down the fort in Xinjiang from 1912 to 1928. Yuan Shikai had made Yang his man in Xinjiang when he appointed him civilian and military governor of the province. Yang also owed a portion of his rise to the top to the Brothers and Elders Society. They had carried water, too, for Yang Zengxing to help him get elected. As far as the central government was concerned, like the other warlords, Yang paid lip service to the central authority. Like any of the warlords at the time, he did whatever he wanted, and that included signing his own treaties with foreign powers. And as soon as he was firmly in control of all the buttons and levers that controlled Xinjiang, he turned on the Ge Lao Hui, the Brothers and Elders Society, giving them a similar fate as the uh, Knights Templars got on October 13, 1307. Yang turned on them, and after that bit of nasty business was taken care of, it was the turn of the provisional Yili government. Yang Zengxin didn't take any chances with them either. They were silenced, and he became the sole voice that mattered in the province. Yang Zengxing used a whole number of methods he learned from the Soviets about how to seize and hold on to power. His reign as the ruler of Xinjiang could be summed up in three words, corrupt, autocratic, and backward. He adopted an aggressive strategy to isolate Xinjiang from China and Russia. Any infrastructure projects that involved linking up with lands outside of Xinjiang, he wouldn't get behind them. He was a dyed-in-the-wool isolationist. And the whole scene going on in Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, and all the other intellectual centers in China, he made sure none of that stuff got passed around Xinjiang. He didn't want anyone getting any ideas in their head. He suppressed Uyghur education. We'll get to that in a minute, but educated Turkic citizens and all intellectuals of Xinjiang were particularly targeted by Yang Zengxin. As any dictator would do, as far as this group was concerned, he took every measure to prevent them from getting their hands on all that dangerous literature wafting in from all the rising pan-Turkic centers beyond Xinjiang's borders stretching all the way to Istanbul, where Kemal Ataturk was then serving as the country's first president. You know, depending on which history book you read, the years that Yang Zengxin ran Xinjiang get mixed reviews. Despite his ruthlessness and determination to keep Xinjiang in the 19th century, society was, by and large, peaceful. There were notorious atrocities carried out by the Hui general Ma Fuxing 
uh, Yang put him in charge of Kashgar, where things were particularly unruly. And so horrific and outrageous were the atrocities committed by Ma Fuxing against the populace there. Well, it caused huge social unrest, and Yang had to send someone to go bump him off in 1924. There's a famous post-execution photo of Ma Fuxing tied to a cross, crucifixion style, floating around the web. Live by the sword, die by the sword. With Xinjiang being closer to Mongolia and the Soviet Union than it was to China, per se. Well, relations with these two places dominated in matters of trade and border relations. Even though he wasn't the head of a sovereign nation, Yang Zengxin, as I said, he cut his own deals with Russia and signed his own treaties. He didn't give the Republican government any face. And remember, thanks to that Treaty of St. Petersburg, Russians had all those tax-free privileges, and the Chinese merchants couldn't compete with them. And on July 7th, 1928, 12 years to the day before Ringo was born in the Dingle, Yang Zengxin was assassinated by a rival at a dinner party, no less, and waiting in the wings to take over was Yang's number two guy, Jin Shu Ren. Like with his predecessor, Jin Shu Ren had the government's backing, but in return for making him you know, provisional chairman and commander in chief, you can say they got nothing in return. Jin had grown up in Gansu and was very familiar with Muslim unrest out that way until his dying day. Jin Shu Ren's policies were always anti Muslim, no matter Uyghur or Hui. With the newborn government in China still trying to sort itself out, the Soviets were more than happy to go into Xinjiang and make deals with the various powers circulating in the area. They had signed a nice, juicy treaty with Jin Shu Ren that, in 1931, in exchange for arms and weapons, yeah, more or less gave the whole store away. Jin Shu Ren had all of Yang Zengxin's faults, plus a few of his own. His time in charge of Xinjiang was remembered as one in which the people were raped and pillaged for maximum personal gain. And during his six-year period of rule there, he managed to alienate and infuriate just about everyone. And at the dawn of the 1930s, Xinjiang was again wrecked with rebellion and protest against all the repression. 1931 was a red-letter year in Xinjiang. It began with a bang, the Hami Rebellion, also known as the Kumal Rebellion. Do you remember back in Part 10, I think it was, how the Muslim authorities in and around Hami threw their lot in with the Qing government rather than endure the policies of the Tsungars, who were Tibetan Buddhist? Now, ever since then, for almost a couple centuries, this portion of eastern Mo Xinjiang, bordering Mongolia and Gansu, was semi-autonomous, and a series of Khans ruled this Kumal Khanate with the consent of the Qing ruler. Well, Jin Shuren abolished it after the latest Khan had passed away, and this Muslim land that had enjoyed a relative calm compared to the rest of the province rose up in rebellion, and Jin Shuren sent an overwhelming force there to put down this popular uprising. And with the populace there enduring all this violence and ferocity, yeah, things were never the same again. The unrest spread first throughout Turpan and by the end of 1932 and into 1933 to other parts of Xinjiang. And all this Muslim unrest that would define the rest of our story here eventually sunk Jin Shu Ren, who fled Xinjiang following a coup in April 1933. The biggest player who came in and put their whole fist into that pie and sort of took over Xinjiang without having to actually take the place over were the Soviets. Nobody knew how to stir up the you-know-what like them. Not until much later, under Mao, will the Soviets have to stop their unfettered harvesting of all kinds of mineral riches and other traded manufacturers of Xinjiang. And this is where the third ruler of Xinjiang enters our picture. We had Yang Zengxin, Jin Shu Ren, and now came the new commander for bandit suppression for the Eastern Circuit, Sheng Shi Tsai. He climbed his way to this position after first serving in Zhang Zuolin's Manchurian army and then for Chiang Kai-shek in the Northern Expedition. He was working for Jin Shu Ren when the nationalists 
Yank Jin out of Xinjiang. So after the Mukden incident on 9-18-31, the Soviets became more interested in Xinjiang than ever. There was a genuine concern out there that as Japan became more assertive in Manchuria, well, it was only a matter of time before they set their sights on Xinjiang, a place they were already sniffing around. The Soviets didn't establish a Manchukuo or anything there, but they took advantage of every single benefit they chanced upon and came pretty darn close. So besides being the nationalist government's third man in Xinjiang, who paid them no heed, Sheng Shih was more importantly the Soviet's man in Xinjiang. Jiang Kai-shek thought Sheng Shih worked for him, but like his two predecessors, Sheng Shih worked for himself. But in the choice of the Soviets or the KMT, eh, Sheng went with Stalin. When he needed Soviet troops to help quell riots, well, they were more than happy to help him out. And throughout this period, even though the fledgling Republic of China government had no power or control in Xinjiang, they never gave up their claim to this land. The top leadership remained resolute in this matter. Unfortunately for the KMT government, it will be Mao Zedong who will benefit from this steadfastness. Not them. Sheng Shih-tai, if you could say one thing about him, was a Soviet stooge. For their support, which came in the form of loans to develop Xinjiang and, of course, weapons, the Soviets continued to enjoy unobstructive access to Xinjiang's bounty. And they didn't even know about the oil yet. Stalin was giddy with excitement at having all this access to Xinjiang. Advisors and engineers flooded in just like they would again in the 1950s. And as China was left to sort out their political problems, Russia got to gorge themselves for a while longer. Besides everything that I've mentioned so far with Chinese and Russian relations in Xinjiang, there was also something else going on called the First Eastern Turkestan Republic. There were two. The first one lasted 1933-1934. It was also known as the Islamic Republic of Eastern Turkestan. All the Turkic blood spilled during the time of Yaakob Beg began to coagulate here in the form of this uprising and declaration of this new state based in Yaakob Beg's former stronghold of Kashgar. From past CHB episodes, we're all familiar with the May 4th movement and everything that was happening with modern learning and the thousands and thousands of Chinese students who fanned out across the great universities in the West and in Japan, bringing all these new ideas and experiences back to China. Well, over in Xinjiang, amongst the Uyghurs there, a similar thing was also happening. This was known as the Jadist movement. And these Jadids, who had traveled the Islamic world and had studied in Turkey and other places in Central Asia, they brought these ideas of pan-Islamic, pan-Turkism back to Xinjiang. And all the vernacular Turkic writings had the same impact on Xinjiang intellectuals well, as much as what Chinese were getting out of the periodicals such as New Youth magazine. And this movement really took hold especially with the more educated and worldly Uyghur elites of the 1910-1920s Enlightenment. They had several legitimate gripes with the government, going back to the Qing. Mainly, the Uyghurs resented that whatever economic improvements that happened in Xinjiang, well, they never became the beneficiaries. They were always getting the short end of the stick. And the leaders of this movement were able to articulate this frustration felt by many, and this pan-Turkism really began to take off, starting in Central Asia and spreading to Xinjiang. And all of this ran concurrently with the whole May 4th movement in China. Predictably, the Soviets were dead set against all these ideas of pan-Turkism and didn't want to hear any talk that called for self-determination. And whatever extremism that percolated in and around Kashgar, where the East Turkestan Republic was based... Well, they didn't want any of that creeping across the border into their perfect little Soviet Central Asian world. With inspiration from the Soviets, Sheng Shih-tai had gone to the trouble to assign official labels to all of the 14 diverse ethnicities who bedded down each night under the Xinjiang moon. This is where Uyghurs, officially on paper, became Uyghurs. The Uyghur identity 
well, had first been applied to those Turkic people from Xinjiang who had emigrated to the Soviet Union in 1921. Among other benefits to the state and having everyone all sorted out for census purposes, it also made them easier to control, manipulate, and most important of all, to keep them divided. The last thing the Soviets or the Chinese wanted was for another Bumin Kagan to emerge from these people to unite them all and lead them. Among the many ethnicities of Xinjiang were the eh, same ones we've been hearing over the past several episodes. Uyghur, Kazakh, Tajik, Kyrgyz, Uzbek, Han, Mongol, Manchu. There were others, too, that I regret we did not get into in this series. The Eastern Turkestan Republic, I just mentioned them, was established in November 1933 in Kashgar. An emirate in Khotan had also broken away and declared independence in March of that year. Their enemies were the Han and the Hui. And just because they shared their Islamic faith didn't make these two groups bosom buddies. They hated each other. And there was plenty of bad blood to point to between them going back to the Qing that kept the animosity burning. When the Eastern Turkestan Republic was first declared... The leaders immediately sought out diplomatic recognition. They had no money, which already put the whole movement behind the eight ball. Like the Dzungars of the last century, they reached out to all neighbors and imperialists willing to hear them out. But no one was too hot to support them. One little amusing related sidebar I wanted to quickly mention was Bertram Sheldrake. He was a London Brit who converted to Islam in his teens and became a huge, huge proponent to introducing the religion and lifestyle all around England. It was a major guy in that community. This was in the uh, 1920s and 30s. After hosting an ETR delegation at his London residence in 1933, later on during a speaking tour in Beijing in the summer of that year at the Grand Hotel de Wagon Lee, some official-looking group from Kashgar called on Sheldrake and offered him the kingship of their new land, which they said was called Islamistan. And while all this was happening in broad daylight, Sheldrake, unbeknownst to him, was being spied upon by KMT agents who were worried about what this whole strange thing was all about and what were these ETR people up to with this Englishman. Sheldrake ended up taking them up on their offer and began being touted around the region as His Majesty King Khalid of Islamistan. He had already long been known as Khalid Sheldrake. You know, Sheldrake's family, they had made it big in the pickles, sauces, and chutneys business, so the press had a field day goofing on his jump from the heir to a pickle fortune to the king of this exotic desert kingdom. (laughs) You think the press is brutal today. Anyway, his entourage started to make its way to Kashgar for this big coronation ceremony, and the whole matter was entirely enveloped in controversy, and all kinds of diplomatic pressure was heaped on the East Turkestan Republic higher-ups about this whole zany notion. And the ETR was already wrought with factions that bitterly opposed each other. And of course, the Soviets gave this whole crazy idea a big, meaty thumbs down. What had just happened with Japan and Emperor Puyi being made the figurehead of Manchukuo was still fresh in their mind, and the Soviets told everyone who would listen, that's what the Brits had up their sleeve, and Xinjiang with this uh, King Khalid, and you wait and see, this Brit was going to end up being the Puyi of Xinjiang? Well, by the time Sheldrake got close to Xinjiang, the whole ETR was already on its way out. The Hui Muslim general, Ma Chongying, after getting beaten in Urumqi, had headed south and got to be the one chiefly responsible for tearing down this first Eastern Turkestan Republic. And King Khalid of Islamistan became the only Xinjiang king to never step foot there. And soon after putting an end to the ETR, Ma Chongying took off for the Soviet Union, or was taken there, we don't know for sure, but he was never seen again, and that was the last we ever hear from him. The Eastern Turkestan Republic never really got off the ground. But as these kinds of events in world history often do, they define a mission or crystallize the essence of a widely shared political consciousness. When the second East Turkestan Republic gets off the ground, this first incarnation will have already sowed the seeds for its creation. 
Well, if you enjoyed freedom, Xinjiang under Sheng Shirtai wasn't the place for you. Maximum repression was carried out against dissenters, chief among them Uyghurs and Hui. The anti-Muslim measures didn't discriminate between the two. Reformers and intellectuals felt it the most. Purges carried out by Sheng Shirtai under the watchful eye of his Soviet backers and advisors led to the deaths of thousands and even tens of thousands of Xinjiang locals with a focus on intellectuals. Into the 1940s, deep into World War II, after Sheng Shirtai saw the USSR in dire straits following Hitler's onslaught and Operation Barbarossa, well, he miscalculated and believed Hitler was going to put the Soviet Union away in this campaign. So Sheng Shirtai decided to unhitch his wagon from the USSR, switch sides, and try his luck with Jiang Kai-shek's government in Chongqing. And to show Jiang that he was on Team KMT, he carried out a bloody purge of all Soviets and communists in Xinjiang. And one of the communist cadres caught up in Sheng Shirtai's net was Mao Zedong, younger brother to Mao Zedong. He was executed on September 27, 1943. In happier times, Sheng Shirtai had reached out to the CCP, then cooling their heels in Yan'an after the long march. Sheng had asked for some assistance and support. Mao Zedong sent his younger brother Zemin and other cadres to Xinjiang with instructions to work with the leadership there. But again, after 1942, when Sheng Shirtai split with the Soviets, any Chinese communist caught in his net didn't fare well. But then after Stalingrad and Russia's incredible come-from-behind victory over the Nazis... Well, Sheng Shirtai realized he should have kept his chips on Stalin, so he figured he'd better try and do some damage repair and get back in the Soviet Union's good graces. So he went and gave Jiang Kai-shek the boot and ran back to the Soviets, who had always served him so well. And the letter he sent to Stalin, sort of, but not quite begging him to take him back, well, Uncle Joe forwarded it to Jiang. And Stalin told Sheng, go take a hike. And so without allies, either in China or the USSR, his star fell very fast. Sheng Shirtai, who did so much to nurture an environment where the Soviets, while the KMT government was distracted with World War II, were able to help themselves to Xinjiang's bountiful abundance and agitate as needed, well, he was finally kicked out of there by 1944. Well... In the five-year countdown to the communist victory in 1949, there were a few more figures who got to write themselves into the history books, having the dubious honor to rule and administer Xinjiang province. At this point, in 1944, eh, all Chiang Kai-shek's KMT government was trying to do was to keep Xinjiang out of CCP hands. Jiang's next man in Urumqi was Wu Zhongxin, who's remembered mostly for the velocity of expulsions of Soviets from the province and his complete bungling of the KMT takeover and the economic disaster that ensued. He got yanked out of there in March of 1946. But in the late fall of 1944, with a little help from Soviet agents provocateur, rebellions broke out in the Ili Valley, again, northwest Xinjiang border with Kazakhstan, then part of the Soviet Union. And this Ely Rebellion, as it became known, culminated in the declaration of the second East Turkestan Republic on November 15, 1944. Unlike the first ETR based in Kashgar, the 1944 to 1949 East Turkestan Republic was based in the Dzungarian portion of Xinjiang, up in the north. The second East Turkestan Republic Another name it went by was the uh, Turkish Islamic Republic of East Turkestan. This was all a Soviet-led operation. They saw all the unrest and frustrations of the Turkic locals there and just went in and exploited it. Jiang had to send the KMT stalwart Mapu Fang to Xinjiang to push back against the Soviets who, well, to put it on a simple level, wanted to return Xinjiang back to the glory days under their puppet, Sheng Shirtai. Ma Bu Fang, he was the brother of Ma Bu Qing and the son of Ma Qi. 
He was also a cousin to Ma Hong Kuei and Ma Hong Bin, all major warlord figures in China's Northwest and KMT allies. They hated communists. They were known in history by many names, usually the Ma clique. In their history, mostly all took place in Northwest China. They were early allies of Yang Zengxin and those two worked together in stamping out all the random brush fires surrounding all the rims of the basins of Xinjiang. These battles between the Soviet-backed ETR rebels and Ma Bufang's KMT-backed army were destructive in so many ways. It was a series of massacres and revenge attacks committed by both sides. How many of these kinds of battles haunted Xinjiang's history going back to the Silk Road? We'll never know. By September 1945, however, the ETR was in control of most of northern Xinjiang. And into this new state of affairs came the next man in Urumqi, sent by China to bring order to that place. And this one turned out to be the best leader of them all. But when you're fighting a losing battle, it's hard to come out a winner. This was the respected Zhang Zhizhong. This guy was as clean as they came incorruptible, a solid official and military man loaded with bona fides. Once he got out there, his mission was to negotiate with this elite government that was spread out over three districts in northern Xinjiang. And for this reason, this period between 1944 to 1949 is also known as the Three Districts Rebellion, Ely Rebellion, or just the plain old East Turkestan Republic, all produced and directed by the Soviet Union. I think they got an executive producer's credit on that, too. Hey, the Soviets had a huge stake in all this because of their own Turkic citizens on their side of the border. If there was going to be unrest, they wanted to keep it on the Xinjiang side. When Chang Zhizhong arrived in Xinjiang, the ETR, taking stock of their situation, was fishing for some kind of role in a coalition government. They were open to dropping the Republic off their ETR name and agreeing to a certain amount of autonomy and being able to call themselves Eastern Turkestan. Then, in August of 1945, the USSR and China government signed a treaty of friendship and alliance. And one of the things Stalin promised was not to interfere in what China had going on in Xinjiang. So, all that confidence they had with the USSR standing behind them, the East Turkestan Republic took a big hit. Zhang Zhizhong, in his capacity as chairman of the new Xinjiang Provisional Government and commander-in-chief of the Xinjiang military, was admired by all sides and had a style that was able to bring disparate factions together. He kept Uyghur advisors close to him and ran his office in a very diverse and progressive manner. He had said, and I'm quoting from uh, James Milward again, quote, We Chinese comprise only 5% of the population of Xinjiang. Why have we not turned over political power to the Uyghurs and other racial groups who constitute the other 95%? End quote. Not many others in the KMT were as progressive as Zhang Zhizhong on this matter. It had to be winner-take-all in Xinjiang, and none of this respect-for-self-determination stuff would be considered. And despite putting everything down on paper that, in theory, looked fair and balanced, well, not everyone was happy with it. Despite appearing to act in good faith to build this coalition government, the Ely government and these three districts, they couldn't take that final step to break with their dreams of an independent East Turkestan Republic. And in the end, that's what they ended up doing. They broke away and acted in a de facto independent way even issuing their own currency. The KMT didn't approve of Zhang Zhizhong's efforts or the deal he made. It went far beyond their bottom line. And it probably won't surprise you to know the Uyghurs didn't think Zhang Zhizhong had gone far enough. And almost as soon as the agreement had been signed, both sides were amending it as they saw fit. Into 1947, there were constant protests. And Zhang Zhizhong did all he could to bring the sides together, but he was getting nowhere. There were too many sides and interests involved, with everyone solely looking out for themselves. Turkic groups who 
tied their fate to the Soviets and those who cooperated with the KMT. Then there were the KMT officials and operatives in Xinjiang. And lastly, the Soviets, the master manipulators who played their hand well and continued to thrive in Xinjiang, a place they knew much better than their KMT frenemies. And by the summer of 1947, with the Chinese Civil War going full bore, everything Zhang Zhong worked to put together fell apart. The East Turkestan Republic and these three districts went its own way and immediately went to work to start building their new nation from the ground up. The KMT regime, based in Urumqi, was in shambles and exercised no true power or authority. After Zhang Zhong threw up his hands and left, the KMT's next representative in Urumqi was Masud Sabri, an anti-Soviet Uyghur intellectual and nationalist with KMT ties. He lasted until January 1949 when he was replaced by one of the darlings of the KMT, Burhan Shahidi. As for Zhang Zhong, he ended up defecting to the communists. And Burhan Shahidi's caretaker government were the ones on duty when the People's Liberation Army under Peng De Huai came knocking. Zhang Zhichong led the negotiations between the KMT government, led by Burhan Shahidi, and the communist representatives. A peaceful surrender was carried out, and the 80,000 nationalist troops in Xinjiang put down their arms. In mid-October, Wang Chun led the PLA's takeover of the remaining seven districts of Xinjiang, and over time, the north and south of Xinjiang were united. And Wang Chun wrote himself into modern Xinjiang history as another one of the more brutal and hated Chinese to operate out of there during his time in charge. Not a popular figure amongst the Uyghurs of Xinjiang. And I just also wanted to mention quickly, uh, the United States had a spy operating in Xinjiang all this time, carrying out covert surveillance operations on the Soviets' atomic program and nuclear bomb testing. This man, Douglas McKernan, was operating in Xinjiang around this time under the cover of you know, being a vice consul. Anyway, he was killed in 1950 and became the first CIA officer ever to lose his life in the line of duty, and Douglas McKernan became the first star on the CIA's Wall of Honor at Langley. So, there it is. From the Tyrim mummies to the East Turkestan Republic surrender to the People's Liberation Army in 1949, a mere 4,500 years or so. My intention was only to take this up to 1911, but after having second thoughts, I decided to just bring the main events up to 1949. You know, Xinjiang's been in the news a lot these past few years. Not for good reasons, either. All the repression, the camps, and all the stories of Uyghurs caught up in this historic nightmare. And countries who naturally would support them in their struggle, looking the other way so as not to offend China's leadership. The purpose of this series was to try and offer you some background understanding of Xinjiang. You know, I joke about viewing everything from 130,000 feet up in the sky, but that's really what this was. Any serious scholars of Central Asia might view these 12 episodes as a brief comic book version of the history, barely scratching the surface of the surface and exploring the land and the diversity of the people and the histories and cultures. When researching this subject of Xinjiang that combines the histories of so many other lands, well, I've been overwhelmed with how much there is to know. I've been yammering on and on for 12 episodes, over six hours, about the history of Xinjiang. And all along, I kept thinking to myself, God, just to, just to explore the history of Khotan or Kashgar or Turpan, just the goings-on that happened over the millennia in those individual places alone could be a 12-part series. I tried to just stick to the main road, but as far as all the other things there are to know about Xinjiang... Well, I hope this little overview whetted your appetite and maybe you'll explore a little, little more on your own. And when you hear about Xinjiang in the news in the coming months and years, I hope this series was able to help you put a little historical context behind what you're hearing and reading, like it is with almost every inhabited place on Earth. And it wasn't always like what you see today. There was a whole long historical road 
that led everything to where it is today. Okay, I don't know about all of you, but I'm ready for a new topic. I hope you found this series to your liking. If you want to learn more, I suggest you start with James A. Millward's Eurasian Crossroads, A History of Xinjiang. I wouldn't steer you wrong. You know, I'm not the most social media savvy guy in the history podcasting space, so I hope you'll all spread the word around to your friends, family, WeChat groups, and whatnot about the CHP. And a big thanks to all of you who have been doing that already. Okay, Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the city of Los Angeles in the state of confusion. It's baking hot here, but not as hot as it is in Turpan, Xinjiang. I just checked. It's 110 there. That's 110 American degrees, baby. Take care, everyone, and please think about carving out half an hour in two weeks' time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.